Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I haven't filmed a video for about a week or so, so I'm certainly overdue. I've got Newton down here sleeping at my feet. It's a very hot day. Since I haven't filmed anything for you guys for a little bit, I'm going to do a summary of many different types of climate change uh, stories that I've come across. And uh, then in, in uh, subsequent videos, I'll focus in on some of the peer-reviewed science papers to explain in detail, you know, what's going on. I mean, the heat waves around the planet are incredibly bad, as you know. Um, my friend uh, Tom Riley, who's the author of this book, uh, Dark Heat, if you haven't ordered a copy and read it, I highly recommend it. He's... Um, ordered a bunch of wet bulb uh, temperature uh, sensors from different companies and he's going to send them to me so that I can do a demo video explaining exactly what, what wet bulb temperature is, how you can actually measure it, and what the numbers mean to your health and safety. Because if we're too close to the wet bulb, uh, you basically need to cool down or you get uh, heat exhaustion, heat stroke, and death you know can happen in the shade outside within about six to eight hours when you exceed wet bulb temperature so that's a very important thing so maybe a demonstration of how you can use the equipment is uh you know it's a good idea that tom had and i i've told him go ahead and send get the stuff sent out to me so what i really want to do in this video as i said is summarize uh, you know, some of the things I've come across, and then I'll have to drill down into some of the topics in other videos. So this is my Twitter. Go to at Paul H. Beckwith and make sure you follow me. You know, it's worth joining Twitter. I'm not advertising for X and Musk and all the nonsense he's up to lately, but it's a good way to get information to people. Um, and I post a lot of stuff on there. Maybe I should switch to thread. So this was a mishmash video on climate mayhem, climate stories, and new peer-reviewed science over the last week or two. This I posted at the end of July. So what I'm doing now, you know, I called it the future we worried about is already here. So I'll this is like an update. The, the future we worried about is still already here. Maybe I'll call it that or something. I don't know, or something. Anyway, um, yeah, so there's loads of really good stuff. Um, this is the world population arranged by income deciles, so the richest 10%, and they're responsible for almost half of the total emissions. The poorest 50% are responsible for about 10% as well. So the richest 10% has more emissions than the poorest 50%. Talk about inequality. You know, what do we mean? What does climate change really mean? You know, we're talking about the warming, the droughts, more and more frequent and intense extreme weather events because we've monkeyed with the jet streams, unreliable yields for growing crops for farmers, more and more wildfires occurring around the planet. What's happening in climate is getting obvious to so many people. There's physical and mental health impacts. In fact, many young women are saying, you know, I don't want to bring up kids in, in a world like this, getting destruction of infrastructure and rickety infrastructure just ask people in houston for, for example or in florida you know there's heat deaths we're getting more outbreaks of insects there's more and more conflicts over natural resources we're getting mass migrations around the planet uh, mass displacement of people there's decreased access to clean water rapid sea level rise and floods widespread hunger all of these things resulting from climate change slash global warming. Okay, so let's have a look at specific things. Okay, so this is a peer-reviewed paper on global net climate effects of anthropogenic reactive nitrogen. Okay, so it's how, how nitrogen is affecting the radiative forcing, um, how it's changing, um, you know, it's contributing to the other greenhouse gases. A very technical paper. I may end up chatting about it in a separate video. We're getting these pyrocumulonimbus clouds from some of these wildfires. This is where, you know, you can, another term might be called 
sort of fire nados are related, but this is a cumulonimbus storm cloud, but it's resulting from a fire and it's resulting from the very, very hot temperatures. The very hot gases produced by combustion in the fire causes huge convective uplift, forming these clouds that look like cumulonimbus storm clouds, but they're actually derived from the fire. And it's producing lots of black carbon the fire is and that's being lofted up almost up into the stratosphere in some cases these pyro these cumulonimbus clouds extend all the way from the ground surface up to the the tropopause which is the dividing line between the lower atmosphere where the weather happens the troposphere and the upper atmosphere the stratosphere where we know the ozone hangs out so these actually cumulonimbus clouds when you see them flattening out at the top that's basically where the tropopause starts where the temperature doesn't change and the clouds uh, have trouble punching up through the tropopause but if the convective uplift is fast enough and and intense enough then it can punch right through and put um and put material into the stratosphere so it's black carbon is going up there and once it's there only gravity pulls it down it takes a long time it's above weather so it doesn't rain out so i'll probably talk in more detail about this uh study um, we're having a growing problem of extreme heat damaging mental health. So there's a very good Carbon Brief article that talks about climate anxiety, uh, declining mental health of people from climate change, and it affects it in all different types of ways. There's physical effects to people. There's sleep effects. And when you lose sleep in hot and humid conditions, then it, there's a real risk of these problems exacerbating mental health getting worse and worse and worse you know mood tends to improve as temperatures get warmer but the opposite's true for people with anxiety depression and psychosis they're likely more likely to experience low mood when temperatures get warmer and when temperatures pass some sort of threshold uh, making it very uncomfortable for people to go about their daily lives and there's lots of stress right there's uh and there's a growing body of research that links extreme heat to increase in violent behavior like homicides sexual violence and assaults and that of course negatively impacts mental health um so there's lots of information in here and stats and you know there's lots of really good stuff and of course policymakers are way behind on this um because you know people didn't really think about this too much until recently this is a um, article, very good article, how heat is testing the limits of human survivability. And there's all different ways in which it kills. And I think I'll talk about this article in great detail when I talk about the, when I do the demonstration um, with Tom Riley's equipment that he sends me on wet bulb temperature. Um, and again, um, Tom's written three books, and this is his latest one, Dark Heat. So have a look. It's a good story. On um, It takes place five, ten years in the future with this young woman and her AI companion and how they negotiate a climate-ravaged world by uh, Tom Riley. That's R-I-L-E-Y. So have a look at that book. And... Uh, yeah, so I think, uh, you know, I'll just summarize this article. Um, you know, there's tragedies occurring. People go out jogging. It's really hot. They don't come back. You know, the, 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 the tracker watch shows them kind of going fine. You know, and this is like an ultra marathoner in this case, right? This, uh, this guy, uh, you know, an ultra, ultra marathon. I mean, he, he ran... He's a 37-year-old ultramarathon runner. He used an app to plot an roughly eight-mile loop through this regional park in California. Temperatures crept into the 90s. He set off with the, from his car, left his phone and water inside, you know, intended to do the trip and just come back. Started at a lightning pace. He, ate, he, he ran the first five miles in each of them in less than six minutes. I mean, this guy is <laughs> like fit is crazy and then the gps data from his smartwatch it shows things started to go wrong he veered off the trail his steps were erratic temperature was about 100 fahrenheit if it didn't show up at the family lunch it took police three weeks to find his body 
and they found the smart watch on him and backtracked and basically he the, the, the heat just made him crazy lose his perspective you know veering and he just collapsed and died you know all the extreme health extreme extreme levels of health i mean ultra marathoner so there's all these different things about how they use a heat chamber they put people inside they see what happens to them, how long they can withstand. So what heat does to your skin, right? It's the sweat glands, uh, you know, they push sweat onto the skin. The sweat evaporates, cools you. When it's too hot and too humid, the sweat just sits there on your skin, doesn't cool you. You get dehydrated and so on. You know, what heat does to your heart puts a lot of stress on your heart because your heart must work harder to, to pump blood and uh, as sweat pours out, the loss of fluids reduces blood volumes. So your heart pumps even harder to maintain blood pressure. You can feel as if it's something out of your chest and then problems. What heat does to your brain, it disorients you. It d decreases your ability to make decisions, right? The hypothalamus orchestrates your body's cooling response, tries to keep your body temperature at 37 Celsius or 98.6 Fahrenheit. That's the core body temperature. Your skin temperature is about um, 35 Celsius. It's a little bit cooler. And uh, blood flow, of course, decreases in extreme heat to your brain. Uh, breathing speeds up. Blood vessels constrict in your neck and skull. So you don't get enough oxygen and glucose in your brain. Your cognitive abilities go way down worsens any mental health conditions, leads to poor, risky and poor decision making, where you start veering on a trail and you just uh, keel over and die. You know, how heat kills, uh, many different ways it does. Uh, there's lots of symptoms like nausea, headaches, muscle cramps, even fainting. There are all signs of heat exhaustion, your body's dehydrated, it starts losing the ability to cool itself. It's a downward spiral right heat stroke happens when your body can't use its usual tricks to cool down like sweating and increasing blood flow to your skin right so your core body temperature goes up if it's a, if it goes up to for, you know 90 um 98.6 right fahrenheit that's what your blood is being pumped from your he uh, heart so when that goes up to um 104 that can happen within 10 to 20 minutes of exposure, right, to hot conditions. But, you know, it can creep up on you very, very quickly, become disoriented, lose consciousness. You know, many people are starting to die from this because your organs basically shut down. Eventually your heart fails. Okay, so all of these things are happening and are being studied. Um, at different parts around the world, wet bulb temperature and so on. So when I'm measuring wet bulb temperatures with the equipment that I get from uh, Tom Riley, I'll come back to this article. Okay, uh, in 2023, a, a carbon budget analysis of 2023 shows there's been a large decline of the land carbon sink in 2023. Right, the CO2 growth rate was 3.37 parts per million at Mauna Loa, 86% above the previous year, hit a record high since observations started in 1958. Right, global fossil fuel CO2 emissions only increased by 0.6%. So, why was this growth rate much higher? It's because the global net land sinks are reduced, they were 0.44 gigatons of carbon per year, which is the weakest since 2003. Okay, there's been lots of fires, there's, uh, you know, it's been super warm, droughts and stuff, all, you know, we're, we're basically changing the planet. We've reduced the sinks on the planet, which absorb carbon. So the, the levels of, of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere will continue to rise faster, thus the levels in the ocean will continue to rise faster with ocean acidification right so all of these things are happening i should probably discuss this paper in great detail the um there's been a rapid acceleration of sea levels off the u.s southeast since 2010 
Now, if you follow my videos and follow what James Hansen has done, he talks about the acceleration of temperatures um, from uh, 2010 onward. So instead of being 0 0.18 degrees Celsius rise in temperature per, per decade, we've moved to point, between 0.27 and 0 0.36. And, you know, we've crossed, uh, you know, 1.5 Celsius, well past it. In fact, we're going to hit 1.7 for an entire calendar, an entire um, rolling year uh, very soon, if we haven't already. So this is about the causes of why the AMOC is accelerating, why the ocean currents are, the AMOC slowing down, rather, sea level rise is accelerating with an AMOC slowing down. Ocean currents are being rewired and changed. Now, people are using neural networks combined with general circulation models to do better predictions on weather and climate. So. Some people are really interested in this. Um, so this is this will be a very technical paper, but I may give it a shot to say how the climate models are becoming better and better using neural nets being trained. You know, it, it, so that's an interesting concept. The there's we've induced changes in the global meridional overturning circulation. Okay, we talk about the AMOC, the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. That's mostly in the North Atlantic, Northern Hemisphere. But that connects to a global meridional overturning circulation, or a GMOC. Um, and that carries into the Southern Hemisphere. And there's been definite changes since the mid-1950s. Um, there's most notably changes in the upper and lower overturning cells of the Southern Ocean. Okay, the upper overturning cell in the Southern Ocean is expanding poleward and into denser water. The currents are strengthened by three to four spur drop since the mid 1970s. That's a lot. The lower overturning cell has contracted and weakened. Okay, so, and these changes are driven by the increasing Southern Hemisphere feral cell strength increases in the westerlies and surface buoyancy law. There are lots of other factors coming into play, but it's in the Southern Ocean. It's very important. It's probably worth a separate video. You know, obviously I can't do all of these, so maybe I just need to do 10 videos a day until I cover all of these things. Greenland ice sheet, right? The um, Greenland ice sheet and surface mass balance. Um, we, we're learning things about it that we didn't know. The Greenland ice sheet wide, the bare ice albedo is overestimated by about 4% in the visible and about 7% in the near infrared compared to the MODIS imaging spectrometer. So our, basically the information on how much light is reflected by Greenland, um, Greenland's darker than we thought by 4% in the visible. It's darker by 7% in the near infrared or heat. So more and more heat is going into melting the ice and into just being reflected up. So this is this is bad, not good news. This is bad news. Um, the asymmetries in the Southern Ocean contribution to global heat and carbon up, uptake, um, specifically, you know, there's a large asymmetry um, in uh, what the Southern Ocean does. The Southern Ocean accounts for 83% of global heat uptake um, versus 43% of global heat, global ocean carbon uptake over the historical period in state-of-the-art climate models. Okay, um, and uh, that's all changing, right? Nothing is staying constant on this planet. Uh, the Arctic right now, this was just posted a few hours ago, the Arctic is hotter than the tropics. So we've got Clearwater, Florida at 88, normal is 90. We've got Dead Horse in the Yukon, it's, 50, it's 89 degrees Celsius Fahrenheit, that's 53 degrees. Um, basically, uh, the normal is 53 degrees. So this is uh, 36 degrees above norm at the moment. Okay, it's just incredibly hot temperatures in, in the Arctic. A critical system of Atlantic Ocean currents could collapse as early as the 2030s. So there's been a lot of stuff on the AMOC and the collapse, um, you know, and I've talked about it in some previous videos, but there's a slew of new material that's just come out over the last week. 
Um, and it said this collapse could happen as the early 2030s, according to new research. So this is a vital system of Atlantic Ocean currents. It influences weather across the world, could collapse as soon as the late 2030s in this new study, which I'll definitely talk about this new study. Okay, they use a state-of-the-art model. Um, it's a shutdown could happen between 2037 and 2064, according to their work. It's very concerning, very worrying. Uh, for example, you know, parts of the UK and Northern Europe would drop, you know, 10 degrees Celsius mean global an mean annual temperature in those regions. An AMOC collapse is a really big danger. We should do everything we can to avoid it. This is according to Stefan Ramsdorf. He's, he was not involved in the latest research. Okay. I talked about some of his work, recent work on the collapse of the AMOC and there's another study, but he's not involved. He's just commenting. Okay, five or six years ago, Ramsdorf said he would have agreed that an AMOC collapse this century was unlikely, though even a 10% risk is still unacceptably high. There's now five papers basically that suggest it could happen this century, even before the middle of the century. So Ramsdorf has changed his 10% risk to saying it's probably greater than the 50% uh, chance that the ocean currents will fail um, this uh, century, will pass this tipping point, and the world will be, will change. Okay, so this is very significant. I'll have to talk about the peer-reviewed paper. So here's a peer-reviewed paper, Nature Communications. It's by a uh, husband and wife a couple, or brother and sister couple. Warning of a forthcoming collapse of the AMOC. Um, open source, um, I'll talk about all of the data. It's very data heavy, lots of good formulas, lots of good illustrations and graphs, you know, tipping point, standard tipping point diagrams given, you know, as you increase freshwater flux and melting, you get closer and closer to this uh, tipping point. This is spur drop movement of the ocean currents, volumetric movement of the North Atlantic deep water. Okay, so this is definitely worth uh, a, um, you know, and, and this was published online July 25th. Actually, this is, uh, this is from last year, right? There's an, this is a paper, this is June, 2024, uh, by another group, probability estimates of a collapse. And uh, yeah, so basically we're heading there. There's papers in the last couple of weeks, more papers on the North Atlantic deep water reduction and the possibility of AMOC collapse. Now, uh, there are a couple groups put together a report, humanity is facing its greatest emergency, a crisis consisting of many interlinked catastrophic risks. There's a report called the Round Table on the Human Future. Future. So here's the report, the Club of Rome's involved, the Council for the Human Future is involved. It's a world call to action on the multiple crises now unfolding humanity. And so it's hosted by these two groups, but there's all kinds of different groups. These, all these different organizations and world thought leaders are involved in this report. And, uh, you know, it summarizes our predicament and then it has quotes from each of these different groups. So Brian von Herzen, for example, at the Climate Foundation, um, and, uh, been on, you know, zoom calls with him being interviewed and stuff. Um, future earth, Australia. So all these different groups, uh, give their two cents about what's happening. Let's go to Houston. More than half of people living in Houston say they might move. Why? Well, they can't seem to get a reliable electricity in the town. Utility companies are failing to prepare for storms. The federal government is slow to offer support, so people die. Okay, so they just, um, Hurricane Barrel, when it swirled through Texas last month, right? This article is recent. It's just from August 2nd. So when um, Hurricane Barrel went through Texas, um, it sustained winds persisted longer than normal for tropical cyclones, so it flooded communities along the Gulf Coast and in Houston. Houston's the nation's fourth largest city. Half of the city's trees were snapped and of course that downed many power lines. At the height of the power outages, 
nearly 3 million people in Texas were without power. Three weeks later, there were still a thousand homes and businesses still without electricity. Okay, uh, most outages were in Houston, which mainly gets power from Centerpoint, a company that made a billion dollars in profit last year. Uh, but they're being slow to do their work in previous storms and in this storm. I mean, it was only a category one storm, right? Um, you know, at least 36 people died in Texas. And uh, yeah, so they say, you know, people are getting fed up. It's a little too late, too little, too late what they're doing. Okay, Houston is the second fastest growing metrop metropolitan area in the country. Last year, a large survey of people found that about 60% of residents have considered leaving the city, with more than half of those citing extreme weather as the reason why. People are just uh, getting fed up, you know, from the you know what the city is doing to provide them with basic electricity okay so the grid is very rickety and climate change is mashing it and many people in this fastest growing city are talking about moving out whether they do or not that's another question maybe it needs a couple more storms climate tipping points depend on net zero targets of course um yeah, they talk about all of some of the different tipping points uh, and uh, climate history, what we've done and what we're not doing. Um, they talk about carbon dioxide removal. Lots of good good links in here in this this report. This is an Axios article on climate tipping points. Achieving net zero greenhouse gas emissions is critical to limit climate tipping risks. This is the paper that the article previously was talking about, and I may have to cover this in great detail. So I have my work cut out for me, obviously, in the next little while. Um, you know, it's devastating. Summer in Canada's Arctic region is bringing severe heat waves. This is a brand new article from today, actually, um, in The Guardian, great reporting on climate change. So temperatures in Canada, especially the Arctic, are climbing faster than the global average, right? As, as you go higher and higher north, the, the temperature amplification increases significantly. In, so in, in, in Inuvik, we're getting temperatures of 33 Celsius. Okay, so people are swimming, trying to cool down in Canada's Mackenzie River. They love it when it's nice and hot. It's so nice to enjoy a true summer, but this is crazy, this heat wave. The heat wave is hovering over the community Community is 130 miles north of the Arctic Circle. Let's have a look at where it is. I've got Google Earth here, and here is where we are. This is Inuvik. This is the town right here. Look how, look how far north we are. If I can get this thing to behave. Okay, so this is North America, Hudson's Bay, the Arctic Ocean. It's right up here. So Alaska is baking too. You know, the idea of baked Alaska I means something different now. Okay, so it's just incredible temperatures. And that increases, that dries things out, dries out the permafrost, dries out the trees. Trees are stunted growth up at that high latitude, uh, but they're dried out. And, uh, you know, so on Wednesday, just past the north, northernmost traffic lights in North America, that's yesterday, a digital thermometer climbed and reached 35 Celsius or 95 Fahrenheit passed an all-time record of 33 set last year, right? Lots of popsicles and ice cream being sold. Uh, the weather alert from Environment Canada said the heat severe, warned of significant threat to life or property. Okay, it's heating the uh, lakes and rivers, it's heating the ground deeply, the permafrost, um, it's a huge problem. Okay, the community sits on more than a thousand feet of permafrost. So if the permafrost starts to turn to mush, then the, the city infrastructure that's built on this permafrost starts to collapse. And there's some people that are actually cooling, putting cooling devices into the ground underneath their house to keep it frozen. Okay, so, you know, and temperatures go as low as minus 56 Celsius in the winter's dark months. 
right? Also, don't forget that the sun, you know, the sun is still up at midnight in this place that far north. So you don't get the lower temperatures uh, for that long at night because of the, you know, it's a land of eternal sun in the summer. Okay, and wildfires are a problem. Uh, in other, last year, parts of the Northwest Territory were burning, so three quarters of residents were thrown from their homes in what in Yellowknife, I guess. The fire burned within eight miles of this little community. Here's a greenhouse where they grow food year round. Um, right, it's very expensive to ship it up there. So if you can be the, the more self-sufficient you can be in a remote northern community, the better. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, Canada is warming much faster being uh, an Arctic nation than the globe. So here's the map again. Um, this was uh, an article from 11 months ago. So Yellowknife uh, was evacuated, right? 20,000 residents. So it's the capital of the Northwest Territories. Had to leave after a wildfire 11 miles away uh, could arrive. Here's a line of cars leaving. Uh, let's just go and look for Yellowknife here. Yellow. Yellowknife uh, National Park, Yellowknife Northwest Territories. There's Yellowknife over here, so quite a bit further south. So they, they had to evacuate last year because of the flames and up here, you know, in Inuvik. Um, the, the, the flames last year also came even closer to this town, Inuvik, than Yellowknife. But I don't think they evacuated, or maybe they did evacuate parts of it, I don't know. Okay, so it's becoming a huge problem for people. This is an interesting article. Uh, Thwaites Glacier is tossing off ice. The world's largest iceberg right now is sitting there and spinning around in circles. It's really interesting. Here's a, it's A23. It's vast iceberg, it's flat, it's table-like top stretches to the horizon. Okay, um, it's twice the size of Greater London, England. This is a BBC article, so they compare it to the city of London, which is huge. So it's just sitting there, it's, ro it's captured basically and rotating on top of a huge rotating cylinder of water. It's not stuck on the bottom, but there's a phenomena where the ocean currents are separating around some terrain topography on the seafloor, causing currents to loop around. And so this thing is actually spinning around and not moving. It's a very interesting phenomena. It's off South Orkney Islands. Now I tried to find it on Google Earth. This is South Orkney, um, the Antarctic Peninsula. You know, it looks like I should be able to see it um, just off up here somewhere, but I wasn't able to find it. I don't think the coverage was sufficient. I mean, maybe it's one of these guys here. I don't know. Or this guy here. I, I think it's further away. But anyway, I tried to find it. It's an interesting phenomenon that is just spinning around. So it broke off the Antarctic coastline in 1986, got stuck on the, in the muddy bottom of the Weddell Sea. For three decades, it didn't move. It was a static ice island, didn't move. And then around 2020, it refloated and started to drift again. And then slowly at first, and then charging north towards warmer air and waters. Okay, in early April this year, it stepped into the A ACC, the Antarctic Circumpolar Current that circumvents the uh, continent of Antarctica. It moves hundreds of times as much water around the globe as all of Earth's rivers combined, which is about a hundred sphere drop. So all of the Earth rivers combined is about a sphere drop, if I remember correctly. Um, and it just it sits there. It's turning anti-clockwise. They call it anti-clockwise in the UK. It's counterclockwise to us. It's spinning about 15 degrees a day. Right? So it's not grounded. There's at least a thousand meters of water between the underside of this iceberg and the seafloor. Right? So there's this vortex that was first described in the 1920s by Taylor. So it's called the Taylor Vortex now. So he was a pioneer in fluid dynamics. Brought into the Manhattan Project to model the stability of the first atomic bomb test. So here, here we have South Orkney and we've got this iceberg and the water is 
is circulating this way around this bank and it's captured the iceberg here. So it's rotating counterclockwise about 15 degrees a day. Very interesting. The obstruction is a 100 kilometer wide bump known as the Perry Bank. So the water's coming up and it go, has to go either way and it's creating this counterclockwise flow which is spinning around the iceberg and it's just sitting there. So it, it, it's interesting to follow it. This is a size if you put it, this is Greater London, England. This is if you put it in the English Channel to give you an idea of the scale, right? So it's it's huge. So there's a, there's scientific buoys in, a, in the Taylor column and it's still being rotating four years later. So it just spins around. This is where the tr iceberg broke off. This is, it moved very quickly. This was April, 2024. It, um, and it, it's basically being captured since you know, for, for, for several months. So interesting phenomena. Um, Antarctic temperatures, heat wave. Antarctic temperatures rise 10 Celsius above average in near record heat waves. Reported temperatures on the continent of Antarctic in midwinter, you know, reached um, 28 Celsius above expectations in some days in July. Remember, things are reversed. So Antarctica, you know, we're in our Northern summer and in the southern hemisphere they're in their winter and the temp temperatures are you know up to 28 celsius warmer than they should be in antarctica on average it's 10 celsius above average if you average it over what a, the past month i guess so it's a near record heat wave um of course it's shrouded in darkness 24 out 24 7 down in the in the southern hemisphere there close to the south pole um and of course, we're seeing record temperatures in the globe. We're consistently above 1.5, nearly 1.7, in fact. And here are some of the temperature anomalies at two meters. This is from the 1st to the 31st of July, 2024. And you can see um, the this dark red area is five to 10 Celsius above normal. And then you have 10 to 15 um, I guess that purple corresponds to this and the scale goes up. So there's some regions that some small regions that are hitting, you know, 20 above the above norm. Um, Antarctica as a whole has warmed along with the world over the past 50 years and for that matter, 150 years. So any heat waves starting off from that elevated baseline. It's the second heat wave to hit the region in the past two years. The last was in March 2022, led to a spike of 39 Celsius and caused a portion of the ice sheet the size of Rome to collapse. OK, so there is some connection to the El Nino and um, yeah, it's it's this is an eye opening sign that climate change is really starting to transform the planet. Um, and uh, yeah, it's uh, they've had the heat wave. Here's another researcher says the heat wave is attributable to a weeks long southern stratospheric warming event, SSW warming event over the region. These SSW or southern stratospheric warming, it, it, exactly what it describes, are really rare over Antarctica. Um, but it is having a impact on the heat wave uh, down at the surface. Okay, so, you know, Twitter, again, looking at hashtag climate change, just looking at the top stories and the latest stories. Um, you know, I thought I'd check that out again. Let's just talk about some of the things that I've come across there. So, of course, Florida is being inundated with Debbie. Unlike any storm, Florida infrastructure fails with Debbie. Well, it's like lots of other storms, actually. The C word doesn't even come up in the report on the flooding. OK, so these stories keep coming out days after Hurricane Debbie has moved on, supercharged with moisture from very warm bathtub, warm Gulf of Mexico. It was barely a category one hurricane. It dropped enough water to overwhelm storm sewers, even in areas that were not categorized as flood zones. OK, uh, you know, the state senator, free market Republican, called for taxpayer bailouts for homeowners, many of whom do not have flood insurance. Many people cannot get flood insurance down in Florida now. 
and they didn't mention the C word, the dreaded C word, ooh, you know, climate change, never mentioned. Okay, very recent trouble. We've just broken 400 year old records on the heat threat to the Great Barrier Reef. This is hot off the presses. Okay, the temperatures in and around the vast coral reef over the past decade, according to a new study, they're the highest recorded in 400 years. They're, they've caused five mass bleaching events in the past nine years. When there's back-to-back -back bleaching events, the coral reefs eventually die. And uh, they take in cores of the coral, gone and measured samples, gone and surveyed the reef, and the reef is basically turning white, it's bleaching, then it becomes algae covered, and then it basically disintegrates, no more reef anymore. You lose all that biodiversity on the reef. This is a peer-reviewed paper, probably worth, worth, well worth me covering. Highest ocean heat in four centuries places Great Barrier Reef in, in danger. I mean, that's you know, it's basically killing the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, extreme heat continues throughout July with devastating impacts. This was an article from the WMO, World Meteorological Organization, about how hundreds of millions of people have been exposed to heat, to, to extreme heat. So doing a demonstration on wet bulb temperature as suggested by Tom Raleigh, I think is a very important thing for me to do. So hopefully I can do that soon. Um, they talk about, there's lots of good images and maps, at least the heat's been, you know, it's been very warm, at least it's tapering off a little bit. Um, and uh, lots of other good information there. Uh, forecasting climate's impact on a debilitating disease. So, Brazil, right, climate and other human-made environmental changes threaten decades-long efforts to fight a widespread and debilitating parasitic disease. Okay, so schistosomiasis, I'm sure I hacked that pronunciation. It's spread by freshwater snails. It affects more than 200 million people in many tropical regions of the world. It can cause stomach pain and irreversible consequences like enlarged liver and cancers, right? It's very bad stuff. There were devastating floods in Brazil in May this, the, the location of the snails is shifted and thus the parasite that's on the snails and there's more and more people being exposed to it. So this ties in the uh, connection of this disease from the snails in the tropical region to people in Brazil. Methane satellite, okay, there's a environmental defense fund um, is working to address climate change through scientific, economic, and legal analysis. Um, and there's a new satellite, Methane Sat, which was launched to monitor emissions of methane. Um, and uh, so EDS, they have money, obviously, because they could fund an uh, instrument on a satellite. So they talk about how the specifics of that of that satellite for monitoring methane. I just want to remind you about this group, Just Stop Oil, uh, because guess what? In July, so last month, in July 2024, five members of the group were given prison sentences for their plot to block the M25 with drones. They were going to do it back in November 2022. They didn't do it. They were stopped. Drones were consecrated. <laughs> confiscated. So this is Roger Hallam, the ringleader, who I've had a number of t discussions and interviews with, and four other people. Hallam is a co-founder of the group, so he, he got five years in jail. The others got four years in jail, right? I mean, totally disproportionate sentencing. So let's not forget about these guys. I'm hoping there's appeals and stuff you know, I don't know how long those will take, how long these guys will be in jail. Hopefully it's not five years. But I just wanted to remind you of that. China had the hottest July since 1961. This article just came out, right? Nobody in the world is escaping this, these, this type of heat. And um, 
The IPCC approves the outlines of the first two reports in the seventh assessment cycle. You know, time and time again, I keep saying, you know, they need to change their cycle. I mean, a report every seven years on climate doesn't make sense. We need to have change reports every year. They, they are working on a special report on climate change in cities. And uh, this is a report on inventories for short-lived climate forces. They, they need to do away with these massive, you know, working group one, two, three reports, each of them 3,000 odd pages long and, you know, comes out every seven years and it's already old news when it comes out. They need to get with the program and have, have yearly reports. I'll just give that um, little plug again. So anyway, thanks for listening. I hope I've given you a, uh, you know, a reasonable, um, reasonably coherent update on all of the myriad factors in which ways in which global warming slash climate change is wreaking havoc on our planet. Please consider going to my website, paulbeckwith.net and donating to PayPal to support my research and videos. Thanks again and bye for now.